Welcome everyone. I hope you're all safe and well in this difficult time. And thank you for joining us today for the seventh Oxford Climate Society event of our eight week online series this term. Before we begin, Megan, Bill and I would like to invite you to take a minute of silence with us to honor George Floyd. It is two weeks today since George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis in the United States. We at the Oxford Climate Society stand in solidarity with those involved in ongoing protests against the systemic racism against and oppression of black people in the US and around the world. We believe that climate change is a social justice issue. As we have highlighted in our events this term, we cannot separate the question of fighting racism and other forms of intersectional oppression from the question of fighting climate change. Uh, if we, sorry, I'm sorry. If we stand by and fail to speak up in defense of those who are oppressed, we enable the continuation of systems of racial, colonial, class-based and gendered injustice that allow us to look the other way when climate change destroys the lives of people elsewhere in sacrifice zones nominated by the rich, the powerful, the white. Climate change is a social justice issue. Climate justice is political. We cannot look the other way and say that because it's happening over there, it doesn't matter here. We must use our privilege and our platforms to support the struggles of those who are oppressed. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and so many others, we mourn you and we will fight for a world that does better. We will take a minute of silence now. Thank you everyone for joining us in that. And we will now move on to tonight's event. Hi again, start again. My name is Olivia Oldham and I'm the media director of the Oxford Climate Society. I'm a student at the School of Geography and the Environment here at Oxford studying a Master of Science in Nature, Society and Environmental Governance. Oxford Climate Society is a part of Oxford University aiming to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our weekly events, we run educational programs throughout the year, including our School of Climate Change seminar program. We also run the world's largest student-run climate journal, Anthroposphere, and are currently working with the university to develop net zero policies and to incorporate climate into all Oxford curricula. The theme of today's event, which I'm so excited about, is storytelling and climate activism. There's a strong focus in the climate movement on scientific data and facts, Listen to the scientists is Greta Thunberg's rallying cry. And facts, science and measurements are critically important in understanding the various and complex phenomena associated with climate change and for trying to avert climate catastrophe. But these facts and figures can sometimes be difficult for people to connect with on an emotional level. And this is where storytelling comes in. Climate change isn't just about temperature measured in degrees, sea level, sea level rise measured in centimeters or meters, it's about people's lives and the lives of non-humans and the effects that these changes have on them. People often struggle to connect with and understand the significance of what they perceive to be dry numbers and statistics devoid of meaning. But what they can connect with are stories, stories of hardship and hope, struggle and resilience. 
If we want people to act on climate change, first we need them to care and to engender care, we need stories. To provide some insight into these questions, I'm delighted to be joined by two amazing speakers who have a focus on both climate activism and storytelling through writing. Bill McKibben and Megan Mayhew Bergman, thank you for joining us. Bill, Bill McKibben is an author and an environmentalist with a history of public activism dating back to the publication of his first book, which I read from my course, The End of Nature in 1989. In 2008, he co-founded 350.org, the first global grassroots climate change movement. He has written nearly 20 books, including the most recent, Falter, published earlier this year, which questions whether the game of humanity has begun to play itself out or whether we can still escape the trap of the climate crisis. He is the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College and a fellow of the American Society for Arts and Sciences. He has won numerous prizes for his environmental work, including the 2014 Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes referred to as the Alternative Nobel. Megan Mayhew Bergman is an amazing author, journalist, essayist, and critic. She has written two short story collections and has a novel forthcoming. She has written numerous articles and essays on climate change, including a column, Climate Changed, about the American South for The Guardian in 2018 and 19, which I highly recommend everyone go immediately and read as soon as this interview is done. She teaches literature and environmental writing also at Middlebury College, which is a coincidence. I did not realize that they were both at Middlebury before I invited them to speak tonight. And she also serves there as the director of the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference. She's a senior fellow at the Conservation Law Foundation and has won numerous awards for her work, including the Phil Reed Environmental Writing Award this year. We're gonna to start tonight's event with each of the speakers giving a short speech with their thoughts on the topic, followed by some questions from myself before opening it up to questions from the audience at the end. If you have any questions for our speakers throughout the event, please write them in the live stream chat box on the right-hand side of YouTube. So thank you so much, Bill and Megan, for joining us today. To start, Megan, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Olivia. And it's a pleasure to speak with you, Bill. I think the last time I introduced Bill at the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference, I um, shed tears of gratitude. I got those out of the way last summer. <laughs> I'll be more composed this time. But I am, I am Bill's very junior colleague at Middlebury. And I, I love being a part of the Middlebury community because I think they place so much emphasis on environmental challenges um, and support our research and our publication and our ability to really teach and inform the new generation of writers and activists coming out. So um, I appreciate the fact that you started this off with a connection between social justice and climate justice. I think um, never has that connection been so important. And, and so I appreciate that acknowledgement. Um, about two years ago, when I started writing for The Guardian, there was a, a Latin phrase that sort of followed me around throughout my life that I, I try to pass along to new generations of writers and thinkers that I'm, I'm helping advise, and that's esse quam videri, this to be rather than to seem. And I think for those of us that want to join this very important conversation, to me, that place of sincerity seems incredibly important. There's so many places now that we can perform our environmental awareness online or in print, but I think what is most essential is to do it from an incredibly sincere place. So I think that's always the first and largest part of work any writer can do, which is that work on a very human level, um, which is getting your hands dirty in the world and activism and experiences. Um, I think that informs the thought quality of, of all writing. <clears throat> I, when I, when I give myself this litmus test, I think about, you know, there's so much noise happening on the internet and, and in this really important conversation. Um, oftentimes I found myself really wanting to give a megaphone to people we don't hear enough from, which are the scientists or frontline communities um, and thinking, how do we make space for these parts of the climate change communication? How do we make sure they're getting the air and we're not just taking up space about climate change makes me sad or here are my, my feelings, um, which I think there is important space for that, but there's a lot of important information that needs to get out into the, into the open and into print and a lot of voices that need to get into print. Um, so in my teaching and in my writing life, 
I, I'm trying to hold more space for this side. And I, I think it's a really important part of being a teacher is thinking, how do I contribute at that level? Um, some of the things that I tell my students to think about when it comes to storytelling and climate change and crafting compelling stories is, um, you know, getting, getting a hold of, and this gets back to that human level work, any sort of righteousness or superiority complex um, and, and really making sure we're continuing to do that work. Because again, I think that elevates the thought quality and the impact of a piece as it's developed. Um, another thing that I think is incredibly important is to honor complexity. And I think that sometimes, I, I saw a statistic recently that a, an increasing number of Americans are having a harder time distinguishing opinion from fact when it comes to journalism and it comes to content. And to me, this departure from fact is it, that's a dangerous space. And, and we'll get into that later in today's conversation as well. Um, but really learning how to honor complexity and perspective in work, um, that it's not necessarily good versus bad, but it is hard and it is systemic. Um, and this complexity um, is important to honor in any sort of storytelling when it comes to climate change. Um, I think I'll, I'll kind of end my opening comments with a thought of something I feel like I can offer, which is building bridges. Um, I grew up in the small town South where, um, you know, Ronald Reagan was a hero. Uh, we didn't have the internet yet. My thoughts and positions were really shaped by the universe that I inhabited, um, which was a Southern Baptist church in a small Eastern North Carolina town. Um, as I got older, I realized the things that I had been taught to believe did not align with my core beliefs and values. I have a deep desire to reach those people who might have been brought up in places or in communities where this conversation isn't easy to have because often the climate change com conversation can be really elitist and is not always conducted in the language that frontline communities or different socioeconomic or regional groups understand or feel comfortable joining. And so as a writer, as a teacher, I think one of the most important things I can do is not just go out into the world looking to intellectually dunk on somebody <laughs> in a piece, um, but to, to say, how do, how do I bring you into this conversation? How do I make the conversation about climate change easier to join? So with that, I'll, I'll pass the torch. Thank you so much for that, Megan. That was really, really wonderful. Um, and we'll now move on to Bill's opening comments. Um, if you'd like to start, Bill. Sure. Olivia, many thanks for having me. Megan, what a pleasure to get to be with you. One of the sadnesses of this pandemic is that even though we're in the same small state of Vermont, we haven't been able to see each other all spring and it's very good to get to see you via Zoom. Um, we do both come from the same, we live in the same small corner of the world, uh, this land that was uh, Abenaki Indian territory and is uh, a place of great beauty, if not that many people. Uh, but it has been a, um, a, a hotbed of uh, environmentalism over the years and of uh, political fights for all kinds of things. Our most famous uh, uh, native here is Bernie Sanders. Um, and, and so Vermont tends to punch above its weight, as we say, in, the, uh, in all these fights. Um, I wanna talk about storytelling for a little while too. Uh, um, you know, I got to write the first book about climate change. Uh, and it was, I was in my mid, late 20, I got 26, 27 when I started writing The End of Nature and a journalist, uh, and, and convinced that I'd stumbled across the, the best story of the 20th century, uh, the most important, and, and for, you know, right at the beginning, that was more than anything else, just that kind of um, reporter's instinct for the idea that here's a great story that needs telling. And so I told it as best I could. Um, and, and, and for a while, maybe for a decade, uh, at least in the United States, if there was a major story written in the magazine or something about climate change, there was about a 70% chance it was written by me. 
And that was a very lonely, in a way, intellectually, it was the oddest feeling for a while of having, have you ever had a nightmare where you can see that something terrible is about to happen, there's some monster or something, and you somehow can't manage to get it across to anybody else, everybody else is just going on with their lives and, and, and not understanding what you're saying or you can't get any words out or something. There were really moments when it felt a lot like that, which is why I have been so grateful over the last 15 years, maybe 20 years, to see an ever growing number of people coming to figure out how to tell these stories uh, in ways that reach people. And at this point, most of my work, uh, and this follows on something Megan said, but most of my work is just trying to uh, uh, direct people in the direction of those new voices. I get to write this weekly uh, free newsletter for under the auspices of the New Yorker. And the reason that I agreed to do it, this thing called the climate crisis, is this section just called Passing the Mic, uh, which is just about kind of trying to find voices that people may not know yet and, and, and handing it over. And I think that's so important because at this point, this is a story that now we can really start to see. When we were telling it 30 years ago, it was a story about something that hadn't happened yet, that was going to happen, and we were offering a series of warnings. And, and now it's more like we're offering a series of bulletins from the front line. And you know those are increasingly disturbing and horrifying. 2020 has been an utterly insane year, so it's hard for us to remember that it began it, the Christmas holidays or over New Year's with everybody watching slack jawed as Australia half burned to the ground, you know? Um, those stories are, I mean, no longer subtle in any way. Uh, uh, they're, they're obvious and powerful and out there and we need them very much to be told, but we also need uh, to understand what it feels like in communities as we deal with these. And we need to tell the stories about how we change and what we can do. Some of those are scientific and economic stories and they're about sun and wind power and things. And some of them are about, uh, uh, well, they're about patterns of domination. And uh, 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 th this has actually been a extremely rich few months, depressing and sad as it's been for people to understand the deep links between uh, environment and disease and racism and uh, uh, power and how they all fit together. And, uh, you know, so those stories, I mean, we, we could talk a lot about all the different categories that stories fall into, but I think one of the most important to get across always is that the iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you suffer from it. And those are the stories I've been trying to tell for a very long time uh, and so many other people now. Um, also, we'll add that I think that there are deep stories to be told that come straight out of the numbers and the science. And I'll just, I'll finish this little talk just by saying, we started 350.org by taking uh, a scientific data point as, you know, as its name, which is a very odd thing to have done. Um, um, and we did it for two reasons. One is we knew we wanted to work all over the world and we figured that Arabic numerals would cross linguistic boundaries more easily than you know, English phrases. But the other reason is we understood that it told the deepest of stories. People said, oh, it's too complicated. No one will get it. And, and I said, I don't think it's really complicated at all. I think everyone will get it. Uh, you know, Here's the number and we're above it too much. That's an easy story for human beings to understand and tell. Then people said, well, yes, but it's such a depressing story because we're already above it. And, and you know, we got 400 and now 18 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere and so on. It's like, yeah, that's a good point, but think about how that works. I mean, think about when you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at your cholesterol level and says, that's too high. Well, the doctors just told you one of those stories that changes your life. Um, you have to then go take action. That's the moment when people get serious, ask what pill to take, what diet, only, in, you know, only a real idiot 
goes home and searches the internet for websites that would say cholesterol doesn't exist, you know, or whatever. So the, the, um, the story that's inherent in those numbers became the, the, one of the ways to help the world organize. But there were other stories too. One of the most powerful has been, and again, about a series of numbers, the idea that, uh, that we started putting forward about a decade ago. Uh, I did it first in a big long piece for Rolling Stone that went very viral, that just demonstrating that the fossil fuel industry had in its reserves about five times more carbon than any scientist said we could safely burn. So there's a story told entirely in numbers, but that has enormous implications. Suddenly it takes those fossil fuel companies out of the category of benign corporation and into kind of rogue piratical villain who if they carry out their business plan will ipso facto destroy the earth. That became the basis of this uh, fossil fuel divestment campaign, which has turned into the largest anti-corporate campaign in history. And I, I'll just end by saying so many thanks to everybody at Oxford who persuaded the university to divest on Earth Day last month. That was, you know, uh, brought us over, I think, the $14 trillion mark in endowments and portfolios that have divested and was one of the great and signal moments in, in, you know, in that campaign. All campaigns throw up thousands of good stories and interesting stories, and we can talk about those all. But in this context, that was a particularly happy one for me. So many thanks to you all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you both for your insights. They're so much appreciated. And just before I start on my questions, I'd like to just flag up to those of you in the audience, uh, you don't have to wait until we finish to ask your questions. You can ask them anytime in the chat box and we will put them into a list and ask them later. So don't hold back. But first for my questions, uh, the first question I wanna ask is, is someone actually asked me this the other day and it really got me thinking um, how you guys would respond to it is, um, you know, some people say that climate change as an issue, it's, it's so complex, it's too complex to be encapsulated by a story. The argument runs that climate change is this sort of multifaceted, emergent, non-linear thing. Basically, it's complicated. Um, while this person was saying that narratives in their understanding have a much tighter sense of cause and effect, beginning, middle and end. And that this means that stories are actually maybe not such a useful way of communicating climate change. But Megan, you said in your opening remarks that honoring complexity is important. I'd wonder what you both think about this argument. Yeah, I mean, I, I always tell my students that writing or storytelling or the content landscape is a huge house. There are so many ways to drop in and plug in. Um, I remember talking to a biologist who works in Key West, Florida, and she, she works with an endangered population of blue butterflies that are whittled away every time a hurricane comes through the Keys. And I said, how do you stay optimistic? And she said, I pick this one battle, this one thing I'm good at, and this is what I hold on to, and this is what I focus on. And so I think for writers um, or people who wanna to contribute to this conversation or tell stories about climate change, you know, it, it takes a lot of experience and knowledge like Bill has to, to be able to talk about these big, deep systemic issues. Some ways you can find your way into this content landscape is by contributing at a really specific story level where you can find that arc and you can, um, I think, you know, a story is an opportunity for connection. It's an opportunity to generate that intense empathy and connection to another's experience. And I say another human or another species. Um, and early on, somebody told me that my skills as a fiction writer would help me write nonfiction well. And I will say that is, I think, proven to be true. But, but knowing how to craft a narrative that gives what we in the South call, you know, a come to Jesus moment. You know, how do you build a rational and an emotional case, layer it together in a compelling piece of writing and leave somebody, you know, with a desire to change their behavior. Um, and now I'll turn it to Bill because I know he has something wonderful to say on this too. <laughs> well, no, the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna disagree only in so far as you're being far too modest, Megan. The, um, I mean, it, what, everything you say is true, but that you don't really need to know that much to tell the big story about this either. 
it's not a complicated story. I mean, I mean, the basic outline of the climate change story is human beings learned how to, you know, burn coal and gas and oil. That changed the world in profound ways. You know, it built modernity. But what you know, what do you know? It turns out that the byproduct of doing all that is that we're dramatically overheating the one planet we've got and causing ourselves extraordinary trouble. So we have to stop doing it. That's the main story that we've got. The couple of side stories are, it's hard to stop doing it because we've got a villain, the fossil fuel industry that will do anything to keep its business model going, even at the cost of breaking the planet. And we've got some heroes, these engineers who have figured out how you can point a sheet of glass at the sun and generate the power that we need. And we've got, you know, uh, thousands and millions of people working in all, I mean, there's, you know, wonderful stories to be told about uh, millions of people working in many different ways to bring this about and to help it happen and uh, how it all goes. But there's nothing that complicated about, I mean, it's, it's as uh, um, archetypal a story as you could possibly imagine. And, you know, straight out of, uh, I don't know, Tolkien or, or C.S. Lewis or, or, or whoever you want. I'm just thinking of Oxfordians at the moment, but uh, you know, whoever you want. Um, 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 and, and very exciting story because we don't know the outcome. Um, unlike most stories that we you know, engage in where we're pretty sure that eventually we'll win, you know, we'll keep fighting and eventually, we don't know. The thing that makes this story so dramatic is that there's a, a time element. Uh, like the most suspenseful stories, there's a ticking clock in the corner of the screen, you know, and, and we don't know whether we're going to be able to do what we need to do in time or not. Clearly not fully in time because we've already lost half the sea ice in the summer Arctic and most of the world's coral reefs are now under siege and we're seeing forest fires on a scale we've never seen before and the world's hydrological cycle, the way water moves around the planet's completely screwed up and there are already millions of poor people on the planet on the move because they can't live any longer where they used to live. Those are all aspects of this story and ways to tell it and, and, and thank heaven so many of those stories are now getting told. Fantastic. Thinking, thinking about this is that it, it has now become the story. I mean, it, it essentially will not end. We will be telling this story for the rest of human existence in, in varying ways. And thinking about that in preparation for this call felt bewildering to me. I think that that feels very bewildering to me a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you there? Um, it's interesting, Bill, that you mentioned this, this idea of heroes and villains because you know that's exactly what um, my my next question is based upon. Sort of drawing on uh, cultural anthropologist Mary Douglas's um, theories of of how people understand the world and their worldviews. I think part of the problem with climate change, what makes it what some people call a wicked problem, or when you add in the time else, the time sensitive element that you mentioned, Bill, a super wicked problem, um, is that people's understandings of what good and bad are in terms of the associated social and political issues related to climate change, uh, the the solutions, the causes. Um, are based on really different worldviews and values. You know, some people see the, the villain, as you say, and as, as Mary Douglas would say, as, as a lack of global governance, um, whereas others see the problem as capitalism and its focus on growth and the injustices that it causes. And other people see the problem as radical environmentalists, like the people who would have a webinar on, on climate change, you know? So, so what role do you think that storytelling can play in bringing people with such different perspectives together to, fly, to fight for climate change, uh, climate justice? Well, I mean, it's, it is very important what stories become the way that we understand these things because they have deep uh, consequences. So the story that I, I've been trying to tell for at least the last decade has everything to do with the fossil fuel industry and its role here. And we now know most of the outlines of that story from, and, and it's incredibly dramatic from great investigative reporting done at the LA Times and Inside Climate News, the Columbia Journalism School over the last five or six years, people have pieced together 
uh, the fact that the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change back in the 1980s. Um, they had, you know, Exxon was the biggest company in the world. It had huge scientific staff. Uh, their product was carbon. Of course, they studied it. And they came to the right conclusions. They predicted with incredible, uncanny accuracy what the temperature and the CO2 concentration would be in 2020. They believed it themselves. Exxon began building all its drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level they knew was coming. The only thing they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. Uh, instead, they waged this, the whole industry, this multi-billion dollar disinformation campaign designed to make us think that there was a lot of doubt about what was going on. Um, um, that's an incredibly interesting, I mean, and that's, you know, that's like, you know, it's like a fairy tale, you know, um, 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 you know, uh, it, it, disinformation at its, you know, most extreme, uh, you know, it's like luring the children into the gingerbread house or something. I mean, it's just, you know, it's as, it's as sinister and crazy as it's possible to imagine. And it cost us 30 years that we're never going to get back when we could have been full on addressing this problem. All you have to do from a story perspective is think about, uh, you know, this, what, what now some novelists do that's all often really fun, the kind of counter history. What would have happened if things had worked a slightly different way? Say the same night that Jim Hansen, the great NASA scientist, a kind of archetypal figure in his own right, the day that he testified before Congress that global warming was real in 1988, say that, you know, the CEO of Exxon had gone on TV that same night and said, you know what, our scientists are saying just the same thing, which by the way, is the minimum that any ethical or moral standard that you could possibly imagine would require of you, it seems to me. Uh, had that happened, well, no one was gonna say, oh, Exxon's just a bunch of climate alarmists. We would have gotten to work on this problem. You know, Instead, just the opposite happened. And so this fight has continued. And you know, last week or the week before, after a long concerted campaign, we did have at least the small victory of driving the former CEO of Exxon, Lee Raymond, off his post as the chair of the board of the biggest fossil fuel lender, JP Morgan Chase, on the planet, specifically on the grounds that he was been a climate criminal, really. Um, so all these stories come, but that's the that's an important story to tell. And if you don't understand that story, you know, then it's then the politics of what we need to do get harder and harder to deal with. It's one of the reasons we keep repeating it in every way. And some of that time that means writing this story. And sometimes it means figuring out other ways. When those reporting first came out in the LA Times and wherever, uh, I knew that it was really important. And I also knew that things just sort of go by often in our world because there's so much noise, as Megan said. So I was trying to think of ways to under, I mean, I just, drove up to Burlington, which is our nearest city. It's not much of a city, but it's what we got, 50,000 people. And I took a little sign that just said, this, this station closed because Exxon lied. And I chained myself to the gas pump at the Exxon station. And you know, uh, uh, a few reporters were there. And by the end of the day, a, a friend of mine at Facebook said, you know what, this was the, that video was the, the the top video for half an hour until it was replaced by a video of some corgis barking at a miniature pumpkin. Um, um, and it was like, okay, you know, that's just like one other way of telling this story. That's what civil disobedience usually is, is a kind of storytelling method to draw attention to something. So figuring out how to tell those stories in many, many different forms on the written page, uh, through your actions, uh, you know, whatever it is, 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 is a challenge and an interesting one. I'm really fascinated by what Bill's talking about, which is that the predominant narrative and, and how that can be regional in some ways. So, you know, to me, it seems like one of the great tragedies of the environmental movement was in the 80s in the Reagan era where the environment became politicized. I sat down with Rick Middleton, who created the Southern Environmental Law Center, and he could walk me through this moment where somehow in the Carter era, we had solar panels on the White House and we had someone who believed and climate change, or at least was environmentally aware and conservation aware. And then in the South particularly, and, and I grew up in this moment, there was this narrative that environmentalists were these you know, kind of pagan, godless heathens. And, and there are people now who still 
believe that and are averse to, or it's become so politicized that even using the term climate change feels like a, a liberal buzzword. And so my friends that work at nonprofits in the South find creative language ways to talk around climate change. They say rising seas, or they focus on this highway flooded X number of times, or there were this many you know, egregious king tides in Charleston, in these places where people are still fighting that predominant narrative. And so I find myself very interested. I think people have to hear something six or seven times before they will allow it to change their mind. And I'm, and I'm so interested in like when we have moments of transformation and like how storytelling can be a big piece of that. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you both. Um, and so my final question um, is, you know, Megan, you wrote in your final climate change column for The Guardian, that one that I mentioned in, in the introduction about her for the audience who haven't read it, um, that one sticking point in having a useful conversation about climate change, and this is useful in the sense of leading to action mm -hmm. um, in the American South was the exclusion um, from narratives of perspective of frontline communities, which is something that you both brought up in your introductory comments. But on the other hand, in the very same column, you also say that there's no room anymore to listen to or provide space for the voice of climate deniers, which I completely agree with. But it seems to me that sometimes, um, as, as you've signaled um, in what you just said in your answer to my previous question, that sometimes those perspectives um, come from the same people, um, or that's definitely how it's portrayed a lot of times. Um, so this is to both of you. You know, how can we how can we navigate that duality? The fact that the people whose voices are excluded from our stories are sometimes the voices who are arguing most stridently that climate change isn't an issue, or who are refusing to see that it's that it is an issue. Um, and how can we tell stories that are inclusive and that amplify voices uh, without also sort of by the by pandering to the climate denial movement? Yeah, I, one of the things that I found in my research that I think is really pertinent to this is, you know, sometimes we think of, of frontline communities as not being as well versed or, you know, if you're focused on just surviving on paying bills, it's really hard to opt into intellectual conversations. But I, I think that is that is shifting. But I think what what Heather McTeer Tony told me, and she was a former Obama EPA appointee in Mississippi. So these conversations are actually happening. They're just not happening in the like liberal elite language or, or articles or discussion zones. And there was a 2015 Pew survey that talks about how um, you know people from Latina, Latina, Latinx populations, um, people of color. Um, are more likely to believe in climate change as a man-made phenomenon than white male evangelicals. And, and in the South, in that region, white male evangelicals are still at the top of most power structures. So it's interesting to think about some of these frontline communities actually do believe and, and are well-versed in, in a different way of speaking about it. Um, so I think that's one, one part of that. Um, I will say, I think ethics wise, Speaking for people is a really tricky business. And I think that climate change storytelling has a lot of work to do as far as opening up the avenues for letting people speak for themselves. And, and um, you know, I, I think that's one of the big opportunities for climate change journalists is to make sure we're offering training and classes and publication opportunities and just really opening up the aperture of who gets to kind of be in the environmental writing space and communication space. Yeah, Megan's right. My column last week in The New Yorker was trying to remind people of something that I forget that not everybody knows, which is that uh, uh, Latino American and African American communities in our country care far more about climate change. Right? I mean, the, the numbers aren't even close. Uh, the problem's not with powerless people who don't care about climate change. The problem's with powerful people who don't want to do anything about it. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, people who are perceived that they're benefiting enough from this status quo at the moment that they don't want to shake it up in any way. And that's why we continue down the path we're doing. And that's why, you know, Donald Trump thinks it's advantageous to keep up his climate denial. He thinks it's going to get him elected again. I think he's wrong, actually. I think by now we've turned a corner, partly because we've built big movements and partly because, you know, I mean, let's, let's be real. In the end, 
Mother Nature is the most powerful storyteller of all. And she has been telling one hell of a story these last years. I mean, at a certain point, you know, if it's the third summer in the row that the air in your city has been filled with wildfire smoke for month on end, who are you going to believe? I mean, Fox News or your own lying eyes, you know? Um, uh, you know, at a certain point, Houston is, you know, gets the greatest rainfall in the history of the United States, five feet of rain with Hurricane Harvey. Uh, North Carolina, a few weeks later, gets the biggest rainfall in the history of the East Coast. Uh, the, the, the entire uh, the volume of water that you'd find in Chesapeake Bay dumped on North Carolina in the course of three days, you know, I mean, at a certain point, people just like, okay, uh, you know, and, and that kind of storytelling is really important. Um, and helping people put things in perspective and understand them is really important. The other thing I would just say is for organizing point of view, for getting things done, the most important fight is not persuading the remaining 30% of climate deniers to come around. Most of them are not going to be persuaded because it's become an ideological badge of honor. You know, if you'd spent the last 30 years listening to Rush Limbaugh every afternoon, you'd have the same trouble, you know? Um, the problem is getting some significant percentage of the 70% who do understand what's going on to be active and vocal in this fight. And that's where, that's where the, one of the important parts of storytelling and one of the important parts of movement building is convincing people that there is a plausible path forward and some hope of it happening. And if you can do that, then people will pour into the streets, then people will lobby and write letters and pressure their endowment funds and do all the other things that need doing. And so that's been an important part of storytelling that we can talk about too a little bit. That's fantastic. Thank you both. And, and Megan, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> I wholeheartedly agree with you um, about, you know, not speaking for others and and you know stepping back especially you know looking at ourselves as a panel of three white people you know stepping back and allowing other people to speak because they have voices and they are talking they're shouting but no one is letting them speak so just stepping back I, I completely agree with you on that um, so I'm just going to take a couple of questions from the audience now um, I've got one here um, from someone who's asking how, how do we create stories with resonating power and long lasting impact? Um, this person is asking this question in the context of a new cycle and media consumption pattern where we move from one crisis, one story to another, you know, we're always moving on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. How do we, how do we stay with a story? Bill, you've got, you know, some decades in this business. Maybe you have perspective on, on this. <laughs> I'll just say, one of the problems often with journalists and artists of all kinds is they place a very high value on novelty, um, on being the first to tell a story, uh, you know, whatever. In fact, the way that stories stick is through repetition, uh, something that uh, people who were, you know, in the deep oral history of human beings knew for thousands of years, and something that every advertising agency on the planet knows. Nobody ever bought one TV commercial, you know? You buy thousands of TV commercials so that you repeat the same thing over and over and over again till it's stuck in your head. And, uh, you know, that's part of this storytelling. I, I, I've written op-eds, I probably wrote, I mean, we decided that the Keystone Pipeline would become uh, a, a great battle and a great metaphor for a thousand other battles. In the first few years of that fight, I probably wrote uh, the same, you know, largely the same op-ed with small changes uh, a thousand times until I was so bored out of my mind by the whole thing. But that was that was what it took, you know. Lots of people doing that, repeating themselves over and over and over again, and it was well worth it because once it was established as a kind of archetype and a metaphor and a rallying cry, you know, that one fight over one pipeline in the United States became a fight over every pipeline and every frack well and every coal mine, none of which get built anymore without lots of opposition. So sometimes storytellers have to just put themselves back in, you know, Homeric uh, mode or Native American mode or whatever it is, and tell the same story over and over and over again. 
and not worry that it's not absolutely fresh and novel all the time. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say, you know, there, I agree with Bill, there's like, there's efficacy and there's artistry and there's just many different ways to plug in. Something I look for for myself is just emotional resonance, um, rational case with emotional resonance. So I'm writing a column on the state of fisheries in America, which are bleak, by the way. Like, I mean, there's like 90% overfishing for several fish stocks and climate change is just going to worsen all of this. And billions of people defend, depend on fish for protein. So the stakes are really, high and then for just at a species care level it's um i think there's a good bit of human exceptionalism at work here uh, but but writing a compelling story about fish you know in this moment is not a given and not easily won right so telling my editor the guardian that i want to write about shrimp she's like megan really okay um but if i can get to the level where i'm talking to a third generation shrimper who's been forced to sell um, shrimp with black gill disease on a hot highway corner in Georgia and I can really have someone drop into an empathetic experience then I can I can kind of begin to speak to the emotional stakes and what's what's being lost. Um, I think sometimes storytellers come out with like the righteous frying pan and I think readers actually are more primed to have an emotional experience when they feel curiosity and discovery at work um, and will allow themselves to go on that that journey with you in a story a little more. That's really interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question we've got here um, is that climate scientists are often very cautious in communicating their message. They don't want to overstate their case um, and risk losing their reputation as an impartial voice or as impartial voices. But in your opinion, is this what they should do? Is this how they should behave? Um, climate scientists, it turns out, are, uh, and all scientists, I mean, there, there are huge forces within the profession that keep them conservative by nature in their predictions, which in many cases may well be for the best. In this case, it did make it difficult for uh, a number of years because scientists were, uh, whenever they talked to the press, would go on and on about the things that they go on internally about. That is, they love the caveats um, uh, as much as the main point that they're trying to make. And that's difficult for people outside the profession. That's changed a lot over recent years for two reasons. One, the scale, the scale of what we're doing climatically has gotten so enormous that it's, it's no longer like hard to see, hard to describe. And two, eventually scientists began to wise up and got pissed off at the fact that no one was paying any attention to what they were saying uh, about the worst thing that ever happened on the planet. And they just upped their game um, and became much better at talking about this stuff and about acting on it. You know, um, for a long time, it was very difficult to get any scientist, with the exception of Jim Hansen, who is a great hero, to go and, you know, to go to jail, to go uh, march, to do any of that. And we worked hard to change that, to help scientists understand what's happening. In 2017, something like that, there was a big scientist march here in the States on, on Washington. And there were similar ones in other parts of the world. And in Washington, there were a good 50, 60,000 people. And I told them, you know, my advice was everybody wear your white lab coat, you know. Uh, we, set, we had groups of people marching with portable blackboards doing equations while they walked down the street, just to kind of underline the fact that these were actually people who knew what they were talking about and should feel free to talk about them. And it's important for that to happen because the polling data shows that at least in the US, scientists and doctors are virtually the only people left with any credibility at all that anyone believes. It's not politicians, it's not lawyers, it's not, I mean, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's the, you know a certain number of professional athletes and doctors and scientists. So it's really important that they've gotten better at talking about what they talk about. Yeah, one of my jobs at the Conservation Law Foundation is to partner with scientists and help them step into the first person because they're trained to avoid first person and they're trained to avoid emotion and passion and and yet the moment sort of demands that of them. And I've worked with several who have, you know, when the government is is funding you, is cutting your paycheck, it's you're you're putting your employment at risk to take certain positions publicly. 
Um, so uh, there's a lot of bravery. I think scientists who are stepping into advocacy um, deserve our respect because they are taking personal risks. And I would love to give the megaphone to more scientists. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got another question here, um, which asks beyond using stories to engage the public on climate change, to what extent and how can storytelling also be useful for reaching policymakers? Bill, you've got more experience with this than I do on policy. Bill, you're muted. You're still muted. This is a good question. And on the one hand, you know, political leaders really mostly respond to political signals. That is, you have to change the polls before you'll get them to change. Our, we have this habit of calling people who have political positions leaders, but really that's stretching the definition of leader. They tend to be followers in a profound way. And there are rare exceptions and that's why they're so valuable. That's why we love people like Bernie Sanders here in Vermont. Um, that said, there are some ways that over time have proven really powerful in shaking up some politicians and getting them to shift. And one of the most important has been taking them places and making them look at things. So we, the, the, if, when we've been able to get you know, congressmen to get on a, a military plane and go to the Antarctic and actually watch the damn thing melting, then it's harder for them to come back to Washington and just blithely repeat all the same old lies from oil companies. You know, um, um, the scale and the awe of the thing has begun to sink in. And, and so that's, that's certainly one way. And a, a, a reminder that, um, that stories come in many forms and some of the best of them are just the sort of brute contact with the world around you and seeing it up close and personal. Yeah, I, when I spoke with um, Bob Inglis, who's a Republican from South Carolina, and we don't agree on anything, but <laughs> he um, he would talk about his his moment where he decided where he became a believer in climate change, and it was experiential, and it was seeing a plug of ice pulled out of the Arctic, and of course that's a privilege to be able to have, you know, an experience like that. But I I have heard firsthand that that does change policy, um, although his constituents. Um, and supporters voted him out of office for professing a belief in climate change. So he, he professed it at great risk. Oh no, <laughs> That's, well, typical. Um, okay, well, I've got one last question here that I'm gonna pull from, from the questions from our uh, audience. And that is, I think one that's particularly relevant given that this is, is a webinar being run by a climate society predominantly for although not only for obviously uh, students. And that is what is the most important thing we can do as students to effectively communicate about climate change? Megan, you go. Sure. Um, I think we're seeing right now in this moment, we all need to sort of decolonize our bookshelves and our minds and our thinking. And um, so I think reading writers like Emily Rabateau or reading um, even Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place, just getting a sense of um, how other people are thinking, feeling and moving in the world and what their experience with, with place in the natural world is. I think that just educating yourself as a reader and a thinker um, and making sure you're sort of uh, pressure testing some of your, your beliefs and boundaries and walls on, on that. Um, so that would be my first suggestion, Bill. What comes to mind for you? Well, I think the, this is not universally true, but one of the things that's often true about students to the question you asked about is that they're young. And so I think it's really important for young people communicating about climate change. And by the way, young people have been driving this movement for a very long time. Uh, there were, you know, Greta Thunberg is magnificent, but there were lots of Gretas for a long time, and there are 10,000 Gretas scattered across the planet now doing great work. Um, but I think one of the reasons that, that one of the ways that young people should be communicating about this is with a certain sense of, um, well, I think with a certain sense of anger about the fact that their 
future is being profoundly compromised by old people who are going to be dead before the very worst of this happens. And I think that, I mean, it, you don't need to necessarily be in an angry way, but I often tell students when they're sitting down with, you know, boards of trustees to talk about divestment from a university or something, one of the things you just got to say is, you know, look, basically the point of a, of a university and the contract we've drawn up over the years is that, you know, uh, uh, old people are going to tell young people things and that'll be good. And for the most part, it is good. It works okay. We've learned some things. We might as well pass them on. But in this case, the moral power rests entirely with young people um, because they're going to have to deal with what it is that we're doing right now. You know? And if we're not able to stop it right now, then there's not gonna be any stopping it 10 or 15 years from now. That time element will, will have run out the game. So I think that it's very important just to be able to say that straightforwardly. And that that's, that's one of the things that makes climate change so interesting, this intergenerational aspect that we quite haven't had in other debates before. And one of the things that makes young people so uniquely able to talk about and communicate about it. Um, the only thing that worries me, frankly, watching the kind of climate strike stuff and the, which is all so wonderful. I mean, it's like the, my dream come true. Only thing that worries me is that people are just gonna take the biggest problem the world ever faced and kind of offload it onto the shoulders of high school juniors, you know? Um, and so young people have to say, no, we need you taking the lead, doing the work. You got us in this mess, you know, work, work our way out of it together and that'll be good. But just keep reminding people that you're gonna have to live with it. Yeah, building on what Bill just said and, and referring back to the politician, Bob Inglis, who I spoke about, the Republican who had this transformative moment of going from denier to believer. He talks about a moment where after he came back from seeing the ice sheet, his son, his young son sat him down and said, dad, show a little courage. And I think that is sort of devastating in its clarity and, and as a call to action. Amen. Amen mm -hmm. to that. Absolutely. I think I, I slightly misjudged how long your guys' answers would be. So we definitely we have time for a few more questions, as it turns out. Um, so, so I'm going to take another one here that someone has asked. Um, how effective do you think fear is as a method for getting people to change their behavior? Um, or what is the predominant emotion that you aim to get across in your writings? I think this is particularly relevant as next week we'll be having uh, David Wallace Wells uh, on, on to speak with us. So particularly pertinent in that regard. Yeah, Bill, what do you think? Well, I don't, I, I gotta say, I don't, I, I don't spend a lot of um, emotional energy trying to figure out which part of the palette to paint <laughs> with, you know? I mean, there's plenty of things to be afraid of here. There's plenty of reasons to hope. There's, you know, plenty of things to be angry about, uh, uh, all of that. And I mean, it just strikes me as from a writing point of view and really from an organizing point of view, uh, just honesty is the smartest possible uh, strategy. Just treating everyone as adults that we're, you know, going to be, or not even adults, as humans, we're all in this together. Let's be honest about all the different parts about it and, and go to work. And some of those are fearful and there's no reason to try and avoid that. You couldn't avoid it if you wanted to. It gets scarier all the time, but there's also, you know, things that are more hopeful all the time. We dropped the price of the solar panel 90% in the last decade. That's super hopeful. You know, the same with wind turbines, which is why if you look out from the English coast, all of a sudden you see the largest wind farms in the world and they're producing huge amounts of power. Those are things to be hopeful about, you know, on and on. So, so I, I wouldn't worry over much about your rhetorical uh, uh, paint box there. Um, um, I think it's important to just paint in all kinds of bold colors. I would, I would second that. I observed a debate on Twitter maybe a year ago between the climate, you know, kind of high profile people in the climate movement about optimism versus pessimism, you know, and, and should we be optimists in our messaging? Should we be pessimists? And I, I come down on Bill's side as well, which is like, we, we need both and there are going to be times 
for both. But I also think about the power, I think it was Catherine Schultz in the New Yorker who wrote about the big one, which was the, the earthquake tsunami, you know, prediction for the West Coast of America. And the way she wrote that piece was again, the rational and the emotional. It's, so the first part is here's why it will probably happen and is overdue scientifically. And then she goes into the second part of the article is this is what it will feel like. This is how the day will start. And, the, and there's you know a moment where the reader gets dropped into a felt experience, which I, I found really powerful and I think can be a useful tool for a writer in a specific piece. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sort of riffing off one of the questions we've got here uh, in the in the chat box. Um, I'm going to simplify it down slightly, but what do you see as sort of the the relationship, or how how would you navigate between stories that focus on structure, um, social structures, economic structures, and stories that focus on agency? In my view, you know, those are both important elements of 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 the story. Um, but how would you do as professional storytellers who get to tell stories for a living, navigate between those two, two sides of the coin. Megan? Sure, I mean, for me, I, I tend to focus on what I'm uniquely suited to do as a writer and make that contribution instead of trying to contribute on all fronts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you can't talk about climate change now without getting into structural issues and societal issues. I think they're inherent in every aspect of climate change that we talk about. Um, I, for me, it will always be case specific, piece specific. And, and again, I just think there's a lot of room and need for both. Yes, one way to think about climate change is less as an issue or a problem and more as an interesting lens through which to regard the world. The, the lens that we regarded the world for the last 75 years was basically about economic growth. Will this thing, whatever it is we're talking about, make the economy larger or not? And if the answer is yes, we did it. And that's, you know, and, and that's been what basically drove all our decision making, thinking, political impulses. It's even, you know, what drove, you know, things like universities. You know, the, the creative writing department was the nice, nice, uh, you know, adjunct to the real work, which was turning out people equipped to, you know, make more money and make the economy larger. The lens through which we're going to look at the world now, if we have any brains at all, is does X thing increase or decrease our chances for survival going forward? Um, and that's a very different, interesting lens through which to look at things. And if you start thinking about it that way, then, then you're spared a little bit the problem of trying to figure out, and I think this is the problem that people like Bob Inglis always face, is how they're going to tell this particular story while they're still very much caught in the old lens of looking at the world. You know. Yeah. I agree. And one other lens that I have found that I, I've used is suffering, just thinking who is suffering here, species wise, human wise, community wise, issue wise, like, who, you know, having a lens for suffering and being yeah, able to talk about smart. it. Very, very smart. Yeah, I, I, I find that very interesting. Thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. um, so another question we've just let's just come through, which is super relevant uh, to the current situation. A lot of our events this term have been very much centered around the ongoing coronavirus uh, situation as it evolves and connecting climate change to that in many different ways. Um, and so this question asks, you know, what do you think will will coronavirus and will COVID change which stories are most persuasive in the climate movement? And what lessons can we learn from COVID and how we frame the climate change narrative? I think it's the biggest, most, you know, biggest change in daily lives that any of us have endured as a society in our lifetimes. And so it's bound to have all kinds of effects. I would say very briefly that the, the three clear lessons that I would hope we take from it are one, physical reality is real. There's no way that, you know, I mean, I've been telling people for decades, you can't make, you know, chemi chemistry and physics compromise or negotiate. Clearly the microbe makes the same argument about biology. And it's very good for this, to, to, since we live in a world where everything seems editable and we just live behind screens all the time. It's good to be reminded that that's not really true. 
if the microbe says wear a mask, wear a mask, you know. Second thing, corollary, speed really matters. Uh, you know, the places that flattened the, the, the coronavirus curve early on are doing well now. And the places like the UK and the US that delayed endlessly are suffering, have to go through far more disruption. And anyway, they get huge piles of dead bodies as a result. Third thing um, is that social solidarity actually really matters. Uh, you know, Megan was talking before about the Reagan era. That was the most important change in American political thinking. And it, in the UK, it was Maggie Thatcher at the same moment. And they both had the same idea. Markets solve all problems. Our job is to get individually rich. Uh, you know, Maggie Thatcher said, uh, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women. Uh, Reagan said, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But that turns out not to be true. I mean, the scariest words in the English language are, we've run out of ventilators, you know? So you can't solve that by pursuing your own self-interest. Those are things you have to have societies in good working order ready to do. So hopefully we will. The only final thing I'd say that's interesting about the coronavirus stuff and climate is, we shut everything down in a way that not even the most radical environmentalist could have imagined a year ago. Like, I don't know anyone who's been on an airplane for months, you know? Um, and so emissions fell at their peak about 10%. So that's interesting. It's good, 10% is nothing to sneeze at, but it's a pretty good reminder that most of the damage we're doing is less the result of individual habits and choices and more stuff that's pretty much hardwired into our systems. So we're gonna to have to pull the guts out of those systems and rewire them. You know, take out the coal and gas and oil and put in the insulation and the sun and the wind. And that's, that's been a, reality is always useful and it's useful to sort of see those numbers and be able to understand what they mean. And, and for me, what it means in the end is the most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual. Join together with others and move large enough to make it possible for us to do that rewiring at the scale that it has to happen. I agree. And I, I think the thing I would also add is, um, and, and I hate to use this buzzword, but is uh, we've had a harsh look at resilience and the pandemic climate change is always going to be harder on those who have less, right? So we, we've seen what that looks like with the pandemic. Um, just the, the, the way it has highlighted, you know, economic inequity and, and how that makes public health issues like the pandemic, like climate change, brutal on those who have not been able to build up a certain level of resilience. And that's a huge problem. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Megan. And I think we're just going to have to wrap it up there because I know that Bill's got to go and we've, we've run out of time. So thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. Uh, thank you so much to Bill and Megan for the fascinating discussion. Uh, did either of you have any final points or concluding remarks that you'd like to leave our audience with? Yes, I want to say, Olivia, many thanks for your good offices here and moderating this. And I want to say, Megan, what fun to get to see you. And it'll be a real pleasure to get to see you in the flesh before too long, I hope, but stay safe in the meantime. Same to you, Bill. And thank you, Olivia. Thanks everyone for your time. Of course, Absolutely. of course. So thanks everyone for tuning in. We've got our next event here on next Tuesday, the last event of this week's, uh, this term series, uh, where we'll be hearing from David Wallace Wells, Zeke Hausfather and Luke Kemp to talk about the existential risk of climate change. So please tune in if you're interested and for more details, keep an eye on our social media and on our website. More details will be coming soon. Um, thanks again, everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Take care and good night.